So we're going to continue our discussion of Java Lambda expressions. And here we're going to discuss how to implement closures with Java Lambda expressions. And in this particular lesson, I'll explain what a closure is. And I'll also show how you can apply Java Lambda expressions to implement simple variants of closures. And this particular example we're going to look at is an interesting one. And we'll apply it in some other contexts throughout the rest of the course. So what is a closure? A closure is a persistent scope that holds on to the value of fields and or local variables even after the execution of code has moved out of a particular block. Closures provide a means to store the result of computations that run in a Java thread, among many other things. And we'll take a look at an example of this here shortly, where you can start up an object that has a closure that runs the closure in the context of a thread, and then you can get the results later after things have finished executing. Naturally, there are many, many other ways of obtaining the results of concurrent computations in Java above and beyond the example I'm showing here. And you can find some videos and slides that talk about these ways, such as Java parallel streams, Java completable futures, reactive streams, and so on, in the link at the bottom of the slide below. So Lambda expressions in Java can be used to implement some simple variants of the concept of closure. And this particular example is available here in this file. This is the check primality class that we use in ways that will become apparent very shortly. So in this particular case, we have a closure, which in modern Java is an object that stores methods, or a method, together with an environment that has at least one so-called bound variable. And a bound variable is basically a name that has a value, such as a number or a string. In this particular case, we have a couple of things. We've got a field called m prime result, and we've also got a parameter, which are the bound variables in this particular case study. So you can see here that what we're going to do is we're going to have a lambda expression that will provide a runnable parameter to the thread class. And in this case, we're going to use it to implement a closure that captures the private field, which is called m prime result, as well as the method parameter, which is the value n, which is of type big integer. Notice that with Lambda expressions in Java, values of private fields can be updated in the context of a Lambda expression. However, you can't update parameters or local variables in the context of a Lambda expression. Local variables and parameters are always read-only, whereas private fields can be updated. So this method called make thread closure is a factory method that creates the closure that's at issue here. So let's take a look at some other interesting methods that are part of the check primality class. And we'll look at this in more detail when we walk through the case study in IntelliJ here shortly. So here we have the check primality constructor. You can see here it takes the value n, which is of type big integer, and it makes a thread closure, passing the value n to the make thread closure method, and then storing that value in this m thread field. Here's the start method that starts the thread and then returns this object. So we return this, and we do this in order to be able to enable fluent chaining. And you'll see some examples of that when we look at the code in more detail. Here's the get result method. This is going to be used to wait until the thread is finished by calling thread join method, which is a form of what's known as a barrier synchronizer that waits until something's, until the thread has gone away. And then we return the prime result, and that will come back as the result from the get result method on the check primality class. So given this simple example, what can we do with it? Well, we'll see when we talk about the case study and walk through it here in the next part of the video that we're going to apply these closures to create public and private RSA keys. So you're probably familiar with using keys that you use for public and private keys to provide better security. And they work by working and manipulating very large prime numbers. So here's how we're going to do this. This is the code we'll walk through here in a second. This is just kind of a, a quick synopsis of what it's doing. We're going to create and start two check primality objects, which are these closures we talked about before. And you can see here we're going to pass in a parameter called uh, generate probable prime, which is going to generate a very, very, very large prime number. That's probably prime. And uh, we're then going to go ahead and, and check the primality of this 
in a background thread or two, two different background threads, one for each of the prime numbers we're generating. And after those computations finish, we're going to get the results. And we do this by calling the get result method on the check primality object. And that will block until the concurrent primality checks complete. And then assuming that both numbers are prime and they are hopefully prime, but we still check them anyway, we're then gonna go ahead and generate both public and private RSA keys. And those again require the use of very large prime numbers in order to give you the kind of security that you would want. I think you have to have uh, at least 512 bit prime numbers and we have 1024 bit prime numbers. So that's the end of the quick overview. We're now gonna walk through the source code and you'll get a chance to see how this stuff actually gets used in practice.